Previously on Mind Games, we've heard about the doubting voices that can undermine even the very best. When I walked out to bat all the time, this bloke on my shoulder was always beating me up and I couldn't control him very well. We've learned how failing to deal with nerves can destroy the careers of the most talented of players. Suddenly, I was a different person. I was so nervous that I couldn't think clearly. And the greatest have confessed to serious self-doubt. I thought, I'm not good enough to play test career. This is, this is beyond me. Well, I'm wasting my time. I just thought, thought I wasn't good enough. It's not just been cricket, though. Other sports have also revealed how mind games can affect the way they perform. When you have this in check, this follows. If you don't have this in check, you can have the best physical attributes. But if that's not right, this won't follow. It's like physical strength, I suppose. You have to work at it. Nothing, though, stays the same, be it in business, sport, or life in general. Things are always progressing. So in this, the fourth and final episode of Mind Games, we're going to look at how the mental side of sport is set to change. How research projects at our top universities are providing coaches with groundbreaking insights into the ways ahead. How advances in technology can prepare the next generation of stars to live and perform in the high-pressure situations that the modern sporting world throws up. And how sport is coming to terms with the importance of mental health. This is Mind Games. Be under no illusion. Top international sport, especially a five-day test match, is about as tough and exhausting mentally as it gets. There's nothing like a test match, for a batsman in particular. A bowling is a physical thing, absolutely. You're physically exhausted by the end of a test match. For a batsman, you are mentally exhausted. And the signs are it's not about to get any easier. As if it wasn't hard enough trying to do the basics against someone who's a world-class player in their own right, the modern sportsman has to cope with life in the most intense of spotlights. You've been playing this way for seven or eight years. It's all gone nicely. You've got to this level. You've deserved your chance to play for, uh, for your country on this stage. And all of a sudden, within 20 minutes, it's being picked apart uh, that you're not up to it. A lot of experienced pundits talking about you and if, if it's the first time you're in that environment and you've got one of your heroes picking apart your technique, that can be quite a difficult thing to get your head around. Of course it's unpleasant when somebody's telling you that the thing you love and you're pouring your heart and soul into that, you're not very good at it. That's pretty tough to take. When you're not scoring rounds or you're not doing well, you stay strong to yourself and you're like, no, no, I'm not going to check Twitter. And, and then I went through phases of, you know, I, I actually didn't, I didn't feel the need to, but it's when people that are close to you or your friends and they are your friends and your family and they care and like your mum and dad are probably the worst for it but they're like I can't believe so and so said this about you and then undoubtedly you will then check that. Identifying the sort of character who can put up with those pressures and still perform is of course something of a holy grail for a sports coach. One of the most distinguished nurseries for England stars of the future is the MCC Young Cricketers at Lords. Old boys include Dennis Compton, Ian Botham and New Zealand's Martin Crow. These days it's run by former Yorkshire fast bowler Steve Kirby, who's very specific about what he's looking for. Character's everything. Of course you need an element of talent, um, but when you get to a certain point, it's, it's temperament, I suppose, is what you're trying to find. If you've got our hands a little bit cramped, that's no good. Getting those hands out and being aggressive with it, you've got more chance, haven't you? Yeah. It's superb, though. well done. I've got a Buddhism mantra, it's, you know, your last mistake's your best teacher. You've got to be willing to make that mistake. And I'm trying to find the individuals that want, that are not bothered about making a mistake. Obviously, if they make the mistake over and over and over again, that's silly. But if they want to learn and they're hungry about that learning, then that's the individual we're trying to find. In America, that need to recruit characters who can perform under pressure means an increasingly scientific approach is being taken at the annual NFL draft. With the 30th pick in the 2018 NFL draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Mike Hughes, defensive back, University of Central Florida. We do uh, medical testing, but we do three different types of psychological testing. And 
the one thing that you want to find is guys that can think on their feet quickly because uh, the game is so fast and can they make those type of decisions yep. and then how do they perform when they're under pressure because guys can be great when you have a lead but if you have to convert a third down uh, what are you going to do do you are you the, a player that wants the ball in your hand with two minutes left to go in a game physical abilities we wouldn't be talking to these players if they didn't have those but the mental part of the game now is such a huge part of it and those are the things that you are trying to identify and that's something that we put a lot of time and energy into another area of huge importance that has gained an ever-increasing profile in recent years has been the awareness of issues surrounding mental health not that that should come as a great surprise really because without a healthy mind mental strength is very hard to come by it's vital it's essential you know the the person's ability to perform you know is is actually fundamentally supported by robust well-being so they have to have the physiological capacity but they also have the mental capacity to cope with the stress and performance environment you know elite sport is all about coping with and performing under pressure. Nick Pierce was the England team doctor who had to recommend that Marcus Truscothic should leave an Ashes tour as his mental health imploded for the second time in nine months. It was to be a seminal moment in cricket facing up to the issue. I remember coming off the pitch in Sydney and just exploding with emotion and tears and stuff like that. And that was it, you know, there was nothing more to be done after that point. It was taken out of my hands when Marcus came off the field in the afternoon and, um, you know, and there was a reoccurrence of the problem he had in India. And uh, we sat and chatted him. Well, I didn't. I left it to the doc to sit and have a chat to him. And after a while, you know, we spoke to him and said to him, look, it's best that he does go home. Marcus's return home from the Ashes was very high profile. And that actually allowed cricket to destigmatize mental health to some extent because, you know, it's unlike most other sports, you know, you could come, you wouldn't come home from a football match or miss a few games, uh, you, you know, in your rugby calendar and anyone would notice. But if you come back from an Ashes tour, everyone understands and knows exactly why you've done that. I've spent a bit of time with various other sportsmen where um, we've discussed around round tables at the House of Commons, for example, where other sports are getting absolutely zero help from unions and, and uh, boards and, and governing people that, that goes on. So um, I'm, I guess we're lucky in cricket that we've, we've identified it pretty quickly. I did once speak to a Premier League football manager and I, I was asking about his staff and he went through the coaching staff, the re reserves, the academy, the physios, the surgeons, the doctors, and he went through everything. And I, I didn't use the term mental health. I said, but what, what do you do if you, if you get any uh, sort of issues with, you know, I don't know, com confidence or motivation? He said, I just sell them. Oh. <laughs> That's astounding, isn't it? The Premier League, you know, if anybody has any issues, just sell them. Wow. I'm going to go against everything that you've heard so far. I think they've incredibly changed. I think there was a stigma, but... There is a real help now. We've got 200 psychotherapists across the country and every single player has got access, every single coach has got access to that facility. And I think football was, it was archaic. You know, I think there was, um, you know, definitely the period that I came through, it was a culture of drinking and, uh, you know, play hard and, hit the, but, it's been a huge in the last 20 years change. One of the most consistent threads that has run throughout this series of mind games has been the debate about whether you just have mental strength or whether it can be learnt. Well, as far as the ECB are concerned, they definitely tend towards the latter, that mental strength is a learnt experience. And to that end, they've commissioned a special research project from Bangor University to try and look into and assess what actually happens when a player is performing under pressure. What I'm going to ask you to do is respond to the words that appear on the screen. And all you have to do is hit the key corresponding to the colour that the word is written in. I'll count you in and say three, two, one, go. We're measuring an individual's heart rate and also their heart rate variability 
whilst doing a very simple computer-based decision-making test. Ben has to respond to words that appear on the screen and as accurately and as quickly as possible hit a certain response. The task itself is incredibly simple and the science behind it is somewhat complex. We've started it already on the Lions program and we've got a project in place with the counties. So we'll go in and with each individual, they'll complete a number of questionnaires which will tell us a huge amount of information about their personality and some of the mental skills that they have. They do a, a, an advanced psychophysiological test and based on that we will then try and for each individual predict before it happens how that player will handle scrutiny, um, expectation and, and the important moments of important matches. What we're trying to do is obviously find the difference between people that go on and have really successful England careers and those that don't. And what is the difference? Is there, is there personality? Is there temperament? Is it to do with the, you know, the number of hours that you've played or the number of games you've played? And, and the more we can refine that, then the more it helps us with our talent ID, but also what support we need to put in place for the players that are on our programmes. The key bit of this study is that we have a comprehensive and multidisciplinary uh, view on performance under pressure. It incorporates aspects of psychophysiology, uh, neuroscience, sport psychology, personality psychology and cognitive psychology in a comprehensive multidisciplinary view that actually is a world first. This seems to me pretty sort of cutting edge. Do any other sports do anything like this? No, and, and this, this was one of the reasons that as the ECB we decided to engage with Banga. What, what tends to happen is researchers have an area of interest, so they'll, they'll look at one particular area of psychology. Practitioners tend to have an area themselves that they're quite good at, but what we're doing here is we're tapping into pretty much all areas of sports psychology that we've looked at, and we're doing it in the most sort of innovative, cutting-edge way um, currently out there. Bangor, though, are not the only university who are trying to better understand how and why sportsmen perform in certain ways. At the National Centre for Sports and Exercise Medicine at Loughborough University, they have a series of different research projects on the go, including one which is helping to try and understand how the brain picks up and processes key early indicators of body language in an opponent. Ryan, we're looking ahead for me to the screen. Yep. So, just the position you'll be during the trials. Yep. All right. Right. I'd say right. In that study we were getting Ryan to respond to rugby players running towards him. Sometimes they'd be deceptive, sometimes not. And we're interested in trying to um, see how early better players can pick up which direction the player's going. Can you train visual awareness? Absolutely. And so there's a bunch of studies that have, have looked at perceptual training essentially. And that's, the goal of that is to try and either shorten the amount of time it, it takes to achieve that, uh, that level maybe enhance the level you can attain or learn it in such a way that you perform better under pressure. But it's not just in the laboratories of our top universities that technology is being used. Justin Rose is one of the world's leading golfers. That's the hat I wear. So what this is, is basically like an EEG reading of my brain, left brain, right brain, it basically tells me if I'm being creative or analytical. So this is what I train with. So when I'm training my routines, I'm trying to, uh, so we're getting basically feedback uh, digital feedback on my app to say, okay, yeah, I'm in, the, I'm in the sweet spot or no, I'm being too creative. What was that thought? What are you thinking about? It's too analytical. So for me, this work is, this is even more important around the greens, chipping and putting as well. I feel like this is really, really key for me. Um, I want to paint a picture. I want to see it. I want to react to it. And the guy who's coaching me can say, oh, you know, what happened halfway through that routine? I'll be like, yeah, I just, I looked down. I just felt like I wasn't really trusting my alignment. And so we're getting that real feedback now. Not everyone in the sporting world, though, finds technological advances or interventions from a sports psychologist helpful or, come to that, desirable. No. Why not? Oh, waste of time. It's common sense. Everything comes down to common sense. The way I rationalised my driver was I can only hit one bad shot at a time, and that, that really took the pressure off. But all that is is common sense. Maybe a psychologist could have said to me 18 months before I'd worked that out, you know, but maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they'd have filled my head full of more nonsense. Nonsense? That's, I'm old school. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't go along with it all. I really don't. Away from the research labs, the big question is how, even when armed with all the theory, can a sportsman prepare for those critical moments when the game is on the line and it's up to them to deliver? Back at Lords, Steve Kirby tries his best with a specially devised programme for his MCC young cricketers. 
Now you've been working for the last three weeks on how you're going to be pressurising and you're trained to play areas. You can't just fire somebody into a pressurised scenario and go, off you go. Because ultimately they'll freeze or they'll, they'll panic and they'll be a bit like a rabbit in a headlight. So our job is to help build them the tools that they can cope with under that pressurised situation. Technically, if they get into good positions and they execute the shot well, they'll take confidence and trust that they can play that when the pressure's on. It's all about when these players get into a situation where they have to play a sweep or reverse sweep, if they're confident and they trust their technique, they will be able to stand up under pressure. Ooh! Are you OK? For other coaches, the mantra of the moment is to practice with consequence as they try to give their net and fielding sessions a purpose in the hope that when those match-defining moments come along, their players won't freeze. OK, are we ready? Two and a half minutes starts now. Good take, Lou. Matty, very good, Matty. If you try and take them out of their comfort zone, you can do drills, scenarios to try and replicate you know, what happens when you're out in the middle. You can't replicate the actual pressure situation you find yourself in a game. You know, 10 million people watching on TV, 50,000 people at the ground. There's, you know, you can't replicate that. And that's the big problem. Until they've actually been there and done it, experienced that much talked about pressure, a sportsman will never know how he or she is going to cope. It's been a problem for players, coaches and sports psychologists alike. Up until now, that is, we've come to Belfast, where the technology of virtual reality is set to change everything. Our destination is Queen's University, where Professor Cathy Craig and her team are busy developing a headset and interactive computer programme which will transport sportsmen into the middle of the world's greatest stadiums. So what's it actually like to put on this headset and what do you see? Well, there's only one way to find out and that's to actually do it. So there's the headset on and immediately here I am in the middle at Lords. There in front of me is the uh, press box and going round is the grandstand, the new uh, stand there where the old uh, Warner stand used to be in the old pavilion and there is a very menacing looking keeper behind me. The technology we use here is much more using what we would call CGI. So the similar type of things you might see in some films, Disney films, whatever. So we simulate movement, but we're using avatars. So we're using virtual representations of players in the virtual context. Here we go, I'm gonna try and see whether I can actually score a run at Lords. This is my only chance. I can't. Not much bounce, I have to say. So what we're really interested in is understanding how we can use technology to understand more how the brain makes decisions about action. So as you know, in any sport, what can often define a winning performance is the key decisions that players make. But we don't really understand what is it that allows a player to make a brilliant decision and what is the information the brain can use to make that decision. You can actually see that bowler running up. You can really focus on the key perceptual information you need to read his type of trajectory. And then you can slowly learn how to face that kind of delivery. So I think Malinga is a great example because he bowls very good Yorkers. So if particularly you're weak on Yorkers, if it may be on the left hand or the right hand side, that's something you could consistently practice with. We can give a batter that opportunity to practice against a virtual bowler without injuring our bowlers. So as we know, fast deliveries, things like that in cricket, put a lot of strain on the bodies of the bowlers. And the benefits of the system won't stop there. In an echo of the Bangor research, the Belfast team say their system will also be able to help identify how players perform under pressure. What we use the cricket virtual reality for is we get batters in, we can have identical balls bowled in the two different conditions, except we can change the amount of pressure and we can look at the effect of the change in pressure on things like performance. Niall's work is very much around trying to understand how pressure is influencing performance. You could be saying that this is going to be a very fast delivery you're going to face, you've got four runs and this is the last over. So absolutely you can do that, you can create a hostile crowd, you can change the auditory content. You could, we can be measuring heart rate of players in these scenarios to make sure that the levels of anxiety are being manipulated and that they can then control that anxiety to play the shot it is they want to play. I suppose when under heightened anxiety you attend to different things, you make different decisions. So in a pressurised situation, if we look at how somebody performs under no pressure, they're making maybe accurate decisions or maybe they're making poor decisions as well. But 
in the higher pressure, we expect to see changes in decision making, maybe earlier initiations of swings, maybe a difference in trade-off, maybe they're taking more risk, maybe we're asking them to chase an innings down and they're making poorer decisions based on that anxiety or that pressure. You are talking all the time to the ECB, are you? They're, yes. they're showing an interest. Yes, we're having great conversations and they're helping to guide us in terms of how we can shape this technology. I think what is is important is understanding what's underpinning this is the theory that we use and it's how the perceptual information the brain picks up guides the action. So by being able to keep that very much at the core of what we're doing, I think we're on a very solid foundation to build an interesting piece of technology. Well, the pace of change when it comes to inventions like that virtual reality system is so quick. It would be astonishing if sometime in the very near future there wasn't something which enabled the sporting stars of tomorrow prepare for those highly pressurised situations. I think we've had three decades. One is the fitness decade, then there's been a decade of uh, data and analytics, and I think the biggest revolution coming our way in sport, the mindset, is definitely the next frontier. And if I've learnt one thing in making this series, it's that players, coaches, sports psychologists alike they all agree that improving and opening up the mental side of sport is a huge untapped area, and those that realise its potential quickest will be the winners. The winners of the mind games.